Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Foreign Correspondence Club of Japan. Uh, my name is Fred Varko, a former director of the club, and we're very pleased today to have Professor Peter Bradford to speak on nuclear and nuclear-related issues. Uh, Professor Bradford is a former member of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, and was a member of that uh, panel, I think, when Three Mile Island occurred in 1979. Uh, he's a graduate and former teacher of Yale University and currently teaches at uh, Vermont Law School on nuclear power and public policy, uh, mainly about the economics of nuclear energy. Uh, he will try and address all your uh, questions and issues today. So please welcome, prof uh, before that, can you turn off your mobile phones or set them to stun? So please welcome uh, Professor Peter Bradford. Thanks very much, Fred. I, I'm very flattered to see such a, a full room and a large audience, and I'm worried that there may be a misunderstanding. I don't look good on figure skates. Um, <laughs> I have no Olympic story uh, to tell, and, and so anyone with those expectations should perhaps leave now. Um, uh, I thought I would talk about two aspects of the U.S. experience with nuclear energy, and I don't want to be understood as uh, thinking that I know what Japan should do, but I can at least lay out the uh, parts of our safety experience after the Three Mile Island accident and part of the way in which that accident caused our thinking about nuclear power's place in our power supply uh, to change. Uh, and then we can use the questions and answers to fit that background uh, as best we can. Uh, what you'd like to ask about uh, the situation in, in Japan. Um, so the Three Mile Island accident was not comparable to Fukushima. It was a much less significant accident. One reactor's core was destroyed. Uh, and for a period of five or six days, it seemed like a very dangerous condition. Uh, then it came under control. Some radiation was released, but nothing like what you've seen at Fukushima. Um, but it was the worst accident in a civilian power reactor anywhere in the world up until that time. Uh, so it was a cause for major concern to the U.S. Uh, regulatory system and the federal government, which regulates uh, nuclear power in the U.S. Um, and there was a presidential commission formed to investigate the accident. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission set up its own independent investigatory group. The Congress did an investigation. Uh, several of these groups had subpoena power. They prepared extensive reports. Uh, U.S. reactors of the Three Mile Island type were shut down for a period of about six months. The companion reactor on the site was shut down for five years. The other reactors in the country continued to operate, so that was a different situation from the one in Japan. But the Nuclear Regulatory Commission suspended all of its licensing activity for a period of about two years while it prepared a full report on the lessons uh, that it considered needed to be learned and the schedule on which they needed to be applied to the operating plants in the U.S. Um, and not only were all of those reports made public, but all of the backup 
information to the reports was made public also. So, for example, all of the interviews that the Presidential Commission undertook in preparing its report were available. Uh, all of the uh, data from the uh, power plant itself in terms of radiation releases, in terms of what went on in the control room, uh, and in the power reactor instrumentation, that was all released. Um, interviews with the governor of the state of Pennsylvania and his decision making with regard to evacuation all became public. Um, interestingly enough, under the U.S. Sunshine Law, uh, any commission uh, like the Nuclear Regulatory Commission meetings are considered to be public if at least three commissioners are involved. So during the accident, during the basically five or six days of the accident, every time three of us, three of the NRC commissioners gathered together to talk about it, uh, even if it was quite informal in one or another of our offices, someone from the commission staff was always present with a tape recorder to uh, you know, the high technology tape recorders of 1979. It wasn't as though we had iPhones, but they, were made, they made a record of these discussions. And within two or three weeks, those records were uh, typed up, transcribed, released uh, to the general public. And they were in some ways embarrassing. I mean, there was a lot that we didn't know during the accident. And certainly, to the extent the public thought that this was a carefully controlled, uh, technologically masterful industry, that sense was shaken up by these transcripts. But they were important in another sense, too, and that was that they showed that we weren't sitting around conspiring to cover up the seriousness of the event, uh, that we were, as best we could, grappling with the same uncertainties that uh, the public and um, the, a number of other uh, officials at other levels of government had. And in that sense, I think it probably was helpful both to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and to the credibility of, of nuclear energy. I'm spending a little more time on this than I probably should in terms of the time we have available, just because of the nature of this group. Uh, uh, I think transparency is a difficult issue in, in Japan. Uh, and I think the likelihood that you would ever see uh, transcripts, say, of the TEPCO uh, discussions with the predecessor to the Nuclear Regulatory Authority is probably uh, pretty low. Uh, but I am suggesting that that kind of, of transparency, even when it's a bit embarrassing, is a, is a, it has a, a strong plus side as long as the officials involved are, uh, are behaving in good faith. Um, so. Uh, there were a lot of lessons learned as a result of the accident at Three Mile Island. They were applied in stages to the nuclear power plants. Um, but the undertaking that we faced after that accident is really not remotely comparable to the challenges that confront the Nuclear Regulatory Authority in Japan today. I mean, that agency is trying to do simultaneously three things, any one of which is more or less unique in the history of nuclear regulation in the world. Uh, first, it's trying from scratch to create itself. I mean, it, it didn't exist at the time of the Fukushima accident. It was created especially to produce a change in regulatory direction. Uh, and that alone is a, a big job uh, for a new regulatory agency. The US went through it back in the 
mid-1970s, not as a result of an accident, but as a result of our Congress getting fed up with the promotional activities of an entity called the Atomic Energy Commission. Uh, and they concluded then that nuclear regulation had to be independent. But when that agency was set up, it wasn't in the crisis atmosphere that exists uh, around nuclear energy in Japan today. The second unique job is the review of the 50 reactors that are shut down. Uh, no other country has ever undertaken a task uh, like that with regard to its entire reactor fleet. And it's important to understand just how difficult it is to review a group of reactors that large, some of which are 40 years old, some of which are, are much newer, against a newer, higher set of standards. Because it's not as though a country decided that the people on the highways were driving too fast, and so there was going to be better highway speed limit enforcement. I mean, that kind of thing you can do fairly quickly. But nuclear safety involves understanding, among other things, the equipment that's in the plant and how it measures up to the standards that you want to apply. And as the standards go up, you've got to be able to review what's in the plants. But if the old regulatory system didn't require good record keeping, if the utilities of 40 years ago didn't keep good data on the seismic qualifications, the fire protection, the ability to withstand accident conditions, then trying to figure out how that old equipment measures up to new standards is very, very difficult. And entities that are saying the NRC is going too slowly or dragging its feet we really need to think again about the nature of the challenge that it confronts and about the credibility issues that they'll create if they insist that it make its decisions before it's good and ready and satisfied that it's, it's done an adequate review job. And then the third unique job, uh, again, uh, something no regulatory agency's ever had to do, is manage the accident at Fukushima, um, which, as I said, I mean, managing the accident at Three Mile Island took us the better part of two years. And that was one reactor with the radiation largely contained and coolable within a configuration in which the water could be recycled and the water from the hills wasn't running through the plant and into an ocean. So. What the NRA is dealing with is a reactor, a combination of reactors that, of course, uh, no one would license a configuration like that. It's, they're starting out with a thoroughly unsatisfactory situation and having to make up the regulatory framework as they go along. It's not an operating license anymore. It's a, it's a license mess. And that's something that nuclear regulators just aren't used to, uh, to having to deal with. You can't train people on simulators for conditions that were never simulatable. So uh, the combination of events that the NRA is facing something that I can understand and put in a framework from my own experience at Three Mile Island, but it's not, uh, it goes way beyond anything that any regulatory agency in the world has real experience with. Now let me shift gears and talk about what Three Mile Island meant in terms of nuclear power's place in power markets in the US. I've already said we never shut down all of the reactors. And eventually, we did resume licensing the plants that were uh, waiting in, in line for licenses. Um, but at the same time, the US Congress and in the US, the economics of utility power supply are regulated state by state. 
many states essentially said, from now on we want to do things differently. We're not satisfied with the paradigm in which the utilities own the generation and the transmission and the distribution. We want to, in power sector language, the word is liberalize, uh, but really in lay terms, you just as easily say break up this arrangement. We don't want generation to be a monopoly anymore. Uh, we want to let non-utility companies build power plants. We want to let new technologies into this mixture, energy efficiency, renewable energy, um, advanced types of gas. We basically just want competition to push this market and to make its way into what gets chosen. Instead of a few people in a closed room saying, we think the next plant should be coal or we think the next plant should be nuclear, we're going to say we need 5,000 megawatts by, let's put it in today's terms, 2020 or 2025. Who wants to supply it uh, and what will the price be? Um, and that led to a very different world. Uh, different companies began to build power plants, different technologies began to meet. Uh, the needs, and at least in many parts of the U.S., some stayed with the old system, but in many parts of the U.S., mm -hmm. the system evolved uh, to one in which the power supply no longer depended on utilities and the bureaucracy, um, but became much more of a commodity-driven, market-driven uh, process in which no one really knew what would be supplying the power in 2025 or 2030 until they asked and found out who was prepared to supply it and on what terms. And I have to say again and again, as the utilities conducted these auctions, they got pleasant surprises. They got pleasant surprises in terms of price, in terms of technology. Um, and in terms of quantity. At first, the utilities were very resistant. They said, this isn't going to work. The new companies won't be reliable suppliers. The new technologies won't work as well as the old ones. It won't be financeable. Um, and there'll be dangers of blackouts and brownouts. In fact, we wound up getting offers five and 10 times what were being solicited. And the prices generally were lower than what was expected. Um, now, I can't sit here and tell you the same thing would happen in Japan, but I can tell you you won't find out until you ask in Japan that that's the way markets work, and it's the way they've worked in Europe as well as uh, in the U.S. What has not thrived in these new markets um, is new nuclear reactors. Uh, no new nuclear reactor has ever bid successfully in a power market anywhere in the world. Um, and the fundamental reason for that is that these markets have the effect of shifting economic risk from the customers who bear the risk under the vertically integrated system that still exists in some parts of the world, largely still exists in Japan. Uh, the customers bear the risks. If, if, if there's a cost overrun uh, or poor operation, one way or another, it will show up in the rates. Or conceivably, if the government pays a subsidy, the taxpayers will bear the risk. But under the power market situation, where company bids, signs a contract, uh, the market continues to solicit electricity and bases its prices on the bids that it gets, the investors are the ones who take the risk. Now, under the old system, the investor's profit is limited, so there's some justification for limiting their risk. Uh, but under the market system, the profit isn't limited, and the risk isn't limited either. You can go broke. Uh, and potential investors won't build new reactors under that framework. There are too many things that can go wrong 
too much money is required per plant and too much time goes by between the time you start to build and the time you can actually earn a return. So what we've seen in Europe and in the U.S. in the last couple of decades is a system in which the markets keep producing smaller, more flexible solutions, often renewable, often energy efficiency. In the U.S. lately, often natural gas because it's become so cheap and because it pairs up well with renewable energy. Um, so uh, on the one hand, the decisions about nuclear power are perhaps seen as being independent of decisions about what to do about power markets. And to some extent, they are, especially in the situation where the 50 plants are shut down. On the other hand, in the not so long run, there will be an interrelationship between what a country does about its power procurement process, whether it opens it up to competition, and what will happen to its nuclear fleet. In the U.S., again, uh, in the last year, actually five of our 104 operating reactors have announced that they'll close uh, because their future operation is just too expensive compared to the prices being uh, the, price, the cost of generating electricity in other ways. Um, now, the other 99 plants intend to continue operating, so uh, who knows whether this is a long-term trend or not. But it is important to understand that there is a connection will be a connection between power market developments and nuclear developments. But the, by and large, in our experience, the surprises you get from the power markets are a lot happier than the surprises that you get from nuclear energy. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Bradford, for a very interesting and enlightening speech. Uh, we'll go to questions now. Uh, with the working press f uh, first. Um, please come up to the mic, state your name and affiliation if you have one, and keep your questions as short as possible. Uh, who wants to ask a question? Okay. Yep. My name is Crowell. I'm with Nuclear Intelligence Weekly in the U.S. Uh, the, there have been three. My, my favorite trade publication. <laughs> three, three investigations into the Fukushima, two by the government, one by a private entity. Uh, and uh, the last ones were revealed more than a year ago, I think. And some of them can't make judgments on certain critical items like whether the uh, <coughs> nuclear plants were fatally da damaged by the earthquake as opposed to the, uh, and so on. Do these, do these investigations take place too soon, in your opinion? I can't say they took place too soon. In terms of the, the general interest in understanding the accident, they you know, I think I mentioned it took, it was five years before we knew what the fuel, the extent of the fuel damage at Three Mile Island. Uh, so all of the studies done in the first year or two afterwards got that wrong. They all thought there had been some fuel damage, but nothing like as much as had actually occurred. The Fukushima accident, is an accident of longer duration. In fact, in some ways, it continues, uh, not obviously with the severity of the first month, but in terms of some things being unknown and, and some things being out of control. So to try to do a study that would be conclusive as to all the effects yeah, I don't think I don't see how one could have expected uh, 
uh, to do that. And I, my assumption is that the people who did those studies didn't expect to be the last word on, on those subjects uh, either. I mean, it, it was just too much in flux. It's, one of the problems we had at Three Mile Island was that there wasn't a lot of instrumentation around the plant or in the plant that was terribly useful. The instrumentation had been set up with the assumption that accidents would never happen. Uh, and so, for example, temperature gauges didn't read above 600 degrees, even though the actual temperature during the accident got up to 25, 100. But why have a thermometer that would go there if it was never going to happen? Um, Off-site radiation monitoring the same way. At Fukushima, years later, it was understood that these things could happen because they had at Three Mile Island, they had at Chernobyl. Uh, but a lot of the instrumentation required electric power. And when the electric power was lost, you wind up really no better off than we were after Three Mile Island. The instruments were there, but they couldn't read or they couldn't transmit. So the processes of figuring out a lot that happened during that accident are, stu uh, are still going to take some time, I think. Um, the other issue that's, that's raised by those studies, and I, I dare say you all are more familiar than I, is what level of access you have to the backup information, to the extent you have questions about them or questions about other areas that they didn't go into. Do you have access to anything like those recordings of commissioners' discussions? My understanding, just anecdotal, is you probably don't. The TEPCO has occasionally allowed people to come to its headquarters for an hour or two and watch a video or take a note, but the, the, the documents just don't get released. Next question, okay. Hi, Eric Slavin with Stars and Stripes. Um, I'm just curious, when you first saw Fukushima unfolding, was your response something to the effect of, did these guys learn anything from what we went through back to, uh, during Three Mile Island? It's a great question. Um, uh, uh, we were actually just talking a little about it at lunch. Uh, when I first saw on television that there had been an earthquake and a tsunami in, in Japan, the press account just happened to mention that there had been also an evacuation ordered for, I think, a two-kilometer area around Fukushima. It wasn't a big deal in the news account, but to me, it was as alarming as anything else I'd heard, because I knew from my own experience, how reluctant nuclear regulators are to have the word evacuation associated with nuclear power. And I knew even more than that, that with uh, um, the combination of the tsunami and the earthquake, you wouldn't want to evacuate people if you could help it, because why would you want suddenly to, uh, first of all, when you recommend evacuation, a lot more people move than the ones just within the two kilometers. Uh, so why would you want to put people on the highways under the conditions prevailing after the earthquake if you could possibly help it? So to me, the situation kind of screamed, this must be much more dangerous than the media's understanding it to be. And I wonder whether the government has the level of communication with this, all the things that we didn't have at Three Mile Island. I wondered whether they uh, existed. Um, but at the same time for that first week, I felt I really had to suspend judgment because during the Three Mile Island accident, we didn't have an earthquake and a tsunami uh, to cope with. So. While it was obvious that there were some high degrees of confusion and a lack of information, it was also quite understandable 
that that would be the case. Uh, the instrumentation might be a lot better, but the conditions were inevitably so much worse that uh, it was going to be very hard for the government to focus on uh, what was going on there. As events unfolded beyond that, uh, I guess I did begin to wonder about the levels of transparency and information that were being uh, given to the public, not necessarily in quite the terms you suggested. I mean, Three Mile Island had been a long time ago. I didn't expect there was anyone in the government immediately familiar with it. There probably weren't even that many people left at our Nuclear Regulatory Commission who were familiar with it in, uh, in detail. Um, but it has seemed to me in the as the weeks and months have, uh, have gone by, that at least as to the processes of transparency and, and public involvement, well, it's a different country, the traditions are different, uh, but there's a lot I would have done differently. Okay, Pat. about the future freelance from Germany. Um, we in Germany were very much affected by the Chernobyl incident because that was geographically close by and we had, of course, effects to this day on people individually who got radiation, uh, for instance, in children, etc., when they grew up. Um, we have had a... Uh, very lively debate in Germany even before that, but even after, and after that, of course, increasingly. Now in Japan, uh, that incident was far away and it didn't cause anything. And the whole system here is built on a basic policy decision, nuclear energy is safe. Mr. Eisenhower, many years ago, had this story about atoms for peace, etc., and the Japanese took it on in policy and policy from the government and the media joined in and they got big advertising, etc. And all the people involved with it were somehow supportive of it. And the anti-movement didn't exist or was not uh, in any way, uh, shall we say, made a public affair. That's a very recent thing. My question to you is, was there no such effort in the U.S. To hide the stuff, uh, to the, the dangers, and to create uh, a supportive movement in public and in the authorities, and get the politicians in this or that direction. For instance, with money paid to, for exercises or uh, scientific research trips or whatever, or advertisements paid for the newspapers, et cetera, to line them all up. There's practically no one of the regular big papers that had an anti-nuclear policy here. Nothing like that in the US? Could you describe that situation a little bit? Uh, there's certainly, over decades, has been uh, a campaign on the part of the nuclear industry in the US to portray nuclear energy as safe, as being the answer to oil dependency, as being necessary to avoid blackouts, as being the answer to climate change. Uh, um, and it includes many of the techniques that, uh, that you mentioned. Um, there's also been a substantial push from the other direction, though, from uh, environmental organizations skeptical of nuclear energy, from people in uh, the Congress and the state legislatures holding hearings into various uh, events that uh, have gone wrong, not just Three Mile Island, but the fire at Browns Ferry um, and uh, and the cost overruns. So, uh, Perhaps because the U.S. NGO community is, is different than 
uh, the one in Japan, perhaps because some of the media has been more aggressive, but also has more information to work with. I mean, our our regulatory authorities, both economic and safety, have their flaws, but between the Freedom of Information Act and the Sunshine Law, they do have access to probably more information than any other uh, large uh, country, certainly I think more than uh, Russia, China, India, probably Japan. I don't know about Canada. Um, uh, so they've had much more to work with and, and push back with. So the answer to your to your question, short answer is yes, the, the campaign has existed in the U.S. as well, but there's been more pushback. Thank you. Joël Lejean from um, RTL uh, France Broadcasting. Um, yeah, the question is about transparency in the nuclear industry. I mean, you, you have emphasized this issue. Um, how, my question would be how, how to make make it a, how do you say, a circle of virtue, something virtuous with virtue. Mm -hmm. How can we come to this? You said by competition. Is it enough? And is there something else, such as a legal system, a legal framework, an obligation, something that is not just a fight from NGOs who have to go to the parliament and strike everyone, or media being attacked by anti-nuclear saying, you don't do your job. What could be done to give more transparency to this industry? beyond the implication of the nuclear uh, industry and the consequences for nuclear military forces? Well, you're, you're certainly correct that it isn't just a sort of generalized policy of market-based or competition. I mean, that, that policy is only going to be effective if it's within a legal framework that assures equality of access to the transmission lines, that uh, assures that all sources have uh, equal access to the market and uh, reflect the actual values that they convey, and that the information about prices, safety issues, uh, is available. So there, I mean, there's a framework of legal changes that goes with the market development. It's more like a chain than a single uh, policy change. If you don't have the laws, don't have the budget, don't have the uh, competitors, in the end you don't get from here to, to there. Uh, I guess I should say, since I'm, I'm actually here because I've been speaking at a conference at the Japan Renewable Energy Foundation that's still going on. Uh, cover the conference um, and you'll get a sense of the different technologies and possibilities that uh, uh, are, uh, are available and also the, the kinds of legislative and policy changes that it takes to uh, bring them into being. Mika can tell you where. Uh, uh, one, two, three. First, four. Siegfried Needle, freelancer from Germany. Um, two, two questions to the nuclear security. One is um, in Japan, they have in some places four, five, or six, or seven reactors at one place. Would it be possible under American rules or regulations to have so many reactors at one place? And the other one about earthquake sec security. I think many places in, in Japan are very not not safe for build to build a nuclear power plant. Uh, perhaps. Um, Researchers now are looking for uh, active and non-active fault, but it's very difficult to say what's active and non-active. So and now, also on Amer American rules, would it be possible 
to have a power plant at such in, in the place with nobody knows is a, is a, is a um, fault active or non-active. <clears throat> all right, well, first of all, I, I stopped being a, a nuclear regulator a, a long time ago, so my detailed familiarity with today's seismic rules yeah. is nothing you'd want to uh, rely on for a reputable newspaper. Um, uh, there are no restrictions that I know of on the number of reactors that you can have at a site in the U.S. As a practical matter, the largest site we have had is three. Uh, and there's one site now where two more are being built and two exist. So that will be a four reactor site. Um, uh, since no one is proposing any more uh, at the moment, I think four is uh, as high as we're going to go, and, and uh, questions like six or seven just aren't going to arise. Um, I'm sure if that is proposed, there will be challenges based on what happened at Fukushima, but I can't tell you what the outcome um, will be. There. In the U.S., half of the plants that were ever proposed were canceled. And if they'd all been built, there might be a five-reactor site out there somewhere. I'm, I'm, I just don't remember. Um, uh, we've been challenged by seismic standards, just as you described, particularly at the Diablo Canyon site in California, where a fault was discovered while the plant was being built. Questions arose as to its activity. The plant builders came back in and redesigned all their seismic equipment and uh, said that they had strengthened it to the point where it could withstand the maximum earthquake. Uh, it's never been tested, of course. The question is now coming up because as Diablo Canyon progresses in its license life, the, the owners are having to decide whether they're going to seek a 20-year extension. And we know a lot more now than we did then about uh, seismic impact. So that will be a heavily litigated proceeding, and we'll know more when it's, when it's over. But the U.S. has a lot of areas where the seismicity is not what it is in, in Japan, and that's where most of the reactors are. On the other hand, they're designed to lower standards, so if we actually had an earthquake well beyond the design basis, even in the east, I think we can't be sure what the impact would be. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Peter Fuchs with uh, Tokyo Investment Research. I cover Japanese markets for global investors. Um, I wonder if I can get your thought on the following, that the zero nuke campaign, it might be a dangerous red herring. And what I mean by that is looking at possible worst scenarios involving Fukushima Daiichi and the decommissioning process of 25 years versus uh, some sort of partial restart of some of the other nukes. And Japanese public opinion in a recent study said that 30 to 40 would, would prefer a, a partial restart uh, with a finite schedule. But um, what I'm getting at is the, the total risk of any of the other nuclear power plants in Japan being restarted and operating versus the somewhat under-stressed risk that still continues up at the Fukushima uh, decommissioning site, where you have tanks of water that are incredibly unstable. You have the removal of spent fuel rods from building four, which is a protracted and also quite hazardous uh, uh, process. And then the future opening up of these things, and let's hope that they don't go, you know, sort of melt out of their containment chamber. Don't you think that there's somehow a disconnect in the public mind between the total risk of all the others that are still intact and safe versus this kind of potentially explosive mixture of the decommissioning process. Does that make sense? You know, are, are people underestimating still the Daiichi problems? You know, I, 
I don't know how to answer that meaningfully because I don't live in Japan and don't have to think in those terms、uh, all the all the time. In my own experience,、uh, different people have such different tolerances for different kinds of risk that it's very hard, hard to the point of impossible, to speak generally about a sort of an overall societal tolerance. I mean, you can get risk assessment specialists who will compare the risks of the 50 plants to the Risks at Fukushima and tell you that one is more dangerous than the other. It wouldn't surprise me to find that they would rather live near any of the other plants than live near、uh, Fukushima. But I just don't feel as though I can say anything meaningful about the calculation of person who actually lives near a different plant. Might make about the risk to them. The risk of having that plant turned on might seem greater than the risk of Fukushima some distance、uh, away. Certainly, I found that a lot、uh, in the U.S. The, the plant that worried a person was the one they lived close to. Okay,、uh, we're running out of time.、Um, question from the floor over here. Uh, uh, I saw a picture of the 30 meter high. Can you high... state your name, please?、Uh, my name is、uh, Inamura as an associate.、Okay. Uh, I saw a picture uh, which, uh, I mean, in which a、uh, 30 meter high tidal wave atta was attacking the Fukushima Daiichi. I thought it was、uh, almost going to be the end of the world. But my question is that、uh, why Fukushima Daiichi was、uh, so, con so much constructed, so close to the Uh, beaches or、uh, without any uh, uh, care uh, to the seismological、uh, tidal wave attack. The second question is that uh, uh, are there some American people who are involved uh, uh, in the construction work of the Fukushima Daiichi?、Uh, because、uh, somebody else already commented that, that there was a strong voice of the Atomic for Peace. And then it was so constructed without any、uh, factors、uh, paying attention to the se seismic or tidal wave attack, as if it was、uh, constructed on the desert to bring in the nu nuclear fuels.、Uh, what do you think? You know, I, I don't know much about the history of the construction of, of that plant. It's a general electric boiling water reactor design, and at that time, General Electric was a U.S. company, so it would not surprise me to find that、uh, U.S.、Uh, personnel were involved in the sale of the reactor、uh, and to some extent in the design and the construction, but I just don't know.、Um, as to the standards that allowed it to be built,、uh, I really know、uh, nothing at all. I know. That in the investigations of our own accident at Three Mile Island, which happened seven years after Fukushima came into service, the conclusion was that the nuclear industry in the U.S. suffered from a mindset of believing that accidents simply would not happen. And that showed up in any number of ways, from the shortcomings in emergency planning. To the instruments that I mentioned earlier that couldn't read above normal,、uh, to the disbelief of the operators when they were confronted by accident conditions. So、uh, it's not inconceivable that the, that the same kind of an outlook would have affected choices about plant location and how high the walls、uh, had to be, but I just don't have first hand knowledge of that. Okay,、uh, just two questions.、Uh, I don't think we, we don't have much time. We have one、uh, writing question from k a l d u n a z a r i a well known Syrian journalist here.、Uh, and he asks, What do you think about Japan actually exporting 
uh, nuclear facilities to other countries? Uh, I think it really, that the safety of reactors doesn't depend very heavily on the country of origin, that it depends on the strength of the standards in the country that's building them, whether the regulators are well trained and the industry uh, has a, a good safety culture. It depends also in some situations, of course, on the proliferation uh, concerns and the agreements for the cooperation, uh, whether there's a a, uh, an accompanying commitment to proliferation resistant or proliferation compatible technologies, but really uh, not that much seems to me to depend on the, the country of origin. I'm, I'm okay if Uh, Langham from Bloomberg News. Um, if you take a look at the three main civil accidents, civil nuclear accidents we've had, Three Mile, Chernobyl, and then Fukushima, one could say they're getting progressively worse. I mean, Chernobyl was bigger in terms of it blew up into the atmosphere, but you know, it has been put that um, Fukushima has gone down, as it were. It's still bleeding into the ocean with radiation and so on. So it's raised the question that um, should there be some form of either UN body or military scale style body to respond to these accidents? Because the, the very nature of them is they're international. They affect other countries. And as you've seen, it's, it, they're very difficult to deal with. Do you have any view on that? Or have you ever heard of any discussions of that taking place anywhere? Thank you. I've. If nothing else, I certainly heard it on television during the Fukushima um, accident. We had one particularly over-the-top commentator on CNN in the U.S. who kept saying, I don't understand why the International Atomic Energy Agency isn't taking over. Well, the answer is, uh, I think, pretty straightforward. It's, it's a terrible idea uh, that you can't send uh, an emergency team in, um, and I don't at all mean to insult your intelligence in asking the question. It's a perfectly legitimate, plausible question. But you can't send a SWAT team into a specific nuclear plant that hasn't trained on that specific plant, especially the older units uh, that built at a time when uh, there was a lot of difference from one unit to another, and the industry was still groping toward what features to uh, standardize around. Um, uh, there's just no way that a, a team of uh, even boiling water reactor experts from another country or a military background could hope to do a better job than the people who, who knew the the plant. Um, uh, there's a slightly different and more troublesome question that I think Fukushima almost posed, which is what happens if the people don't want to stay? Uh, and uh, how do you make sure somebody actually does stay and operate the plant? But the answer isn't going to be fly them in from Geneva. Um, it's, the next is uh, Edwin. Edwin Carmel, freelance. This may be a repeated. Uh, do you believe that uh, if Japan would have immediately accepted the overseas, uh, the assistance of the overseas nuclear experts, the meltdown and other after effects could have been averted? I also point that uh, uh, TEPCO did not, uh, the uh, maintenance was very bad. Mm. 
I haven't heard that there were a lot of good ideas floating around, say, at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the U.S. that would have changed the course of the accident, but I'm probably not the right person to give you a good answer to that uh, question. I know Greg Jaxco, who was the chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission at that time, is going to be in Japan during the uh, March 11th commemorations, and he'd be a, a better person to ask. My sense is that once that accident was underway, uh, there wasn't a lot that could have been done to keep the uh, – well, I shouldn't say that. There were things that could have been done to improve the situation, but there's no assurance that foreign experts would have thought of them any more than the, the Japanese plant operators did. We have one final question, Jimbo at the back. Hello, I'm Teddy Jimbo with the Video News. Um, two quick questions. One is, the: uh, uh, do you think Japan is fit, as, or a seismic country like Japan is fit to operate a nuclear plant? That's question number one. Number two is, the uh, one of the unspoken secret about the Japanese nuclear program is that even if it wants to stop uh, running a nuclear uh, plant, it can't. It have no choice because um, right now about $15 billion worth of spent nuclear fuel is registered as an asset by uh, power companies because they're, they're supposed to be used as a fuel again. But once the program is stopped, it'll be registered as the uh, liability, and it's in, if big enough to send all the power companies insolvent. <coughs> of course, another is uh, 17,000 uh, tons of uh, spent fuel, which is now stored in interim uh, storage site in Aomori. They have to be uh, sent back to uh, each nuclear power plant, but there's no space for storage. So, th so for those two reasons, um, government doesn't really have a choice but to just keep on running. Uh, as a law expert, do you have any advice or any, any thought on the situation Japan stuck with now? Thank you. Uh, it, well, first of all, as to the seismicity issues, I, I just don't know. The, that's a question for people with a different skill set than, uh, than I have. Um, uh, The, and in a way, the best answer to your second question is probably that I don't know uh, uh, either. Um, but, you know, we do have some experience, nothing like the, the situation that Japanese face now, but some experience in the U.S. and in other countries with decisions to step back from either particular nuclear plants or, in Germany's case, a lot of uh, nuclear capacity. And, you know, yes, it's, it's certainly difficult, potentially expensive, uh, but there are you know, the, the different ways to do it, too. It can be done in steps. Uh, um, uh, it can be done in phases. Uh, and I don't know, uh, for example, what kind of reserves have been built up to deal with spent fuel, with, uh, with decommissioning. If those reserves don't exist, uh, it's probably time to start building them because uh, uh, that's something that in the U.S. system we began charging customers for back in the early 1980s, and we may not have enough money built up. That remains to be seen, but we do have two, bitty, two pretty big sets of funds, one for spent fuel and one for decommissioning today. 
Okay, I'm sorry, we have to leave things there as we have another press conference coming up. Uh -huh. Um, excuse me again, Joël Legendre. I, I agree with what you, you, you say on, on many points, but as far as I remember in 2001, the Supreme Court of the United States has denied any um, a positive answer to the people who have sued. Um, there were thousands of people living near Three Mile Island who have asked compensations, as we have here in Tokyo, in Fukushima also. But in 2001, I think the Supreme Court has decided that there would be no uh, no way for them to have satisfaction. So here is a question again. Um, why is it that we try to preserve an industry more than the people? Well, I am not familiar with that decision, but I do know that uh, I think something on the order of 100 to $150 million was paid. Uh, in compensation after the accident at Three Mile Island. I mean, again, it's another area in which U.S. law requires the building up of a fund and the maintaining of, well, there's several layers, but uh, the private operator has to have 300 million and then the industry as a whole has to build an amount up to 12 billion. So it's not enough by any means to cover Fukushima, but it did make some uh, payments after Three Mile Island. Uh, if I knew anything about that Supreme Court case, I could give you a more coherent answer. But it's not correct to say that no damages were paid. OK, thank you very much, Professor Bradford. And I'd like to give a, a warm thanks to our guest today for a very enlightening speech. And I'm thank you. Today. And as a token of our appreciation, we will give Prof Professor Bradford a one-year honorary membership to the club. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. I hope I'll get back to use it. Yeah, yeah. Uh,